Thank you very much for that very informative presentation. So uh, thank you for sharing the information on where to get your books and how people can reach out to you. We're now going to begin our live Q&A session. I'll be asking questions as well as opening up to the audience. So um, I'd like to explain a little bit about how we're going to go about this process. We will we don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we ask everyone to, uh, to virtually raise their hand if you're not sure how to do this. What you need to do is click the reactions button, which is located second to the right in the Zoom window on the toward the bottom. Then you'll click on the raise hand function in the menu that pops up. We will take questions in the order in which they are received. When it's your turn, I will unmute you and I will prompt you to state where you're from and ask your question. We ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you in order to give everyone a chance to ask the question as best we can. We won't be taking follow-up questions. However, if you would like to ask another question, you can get back online. And um, and then um, I'll be asking questions as well. And we'll be going until approximately 11 o'clock this morning. That's Eastern time. So our first question from the audience is gonna come from Rita. Rita, please state your name and where you, oh, sorry, well, not your name, but where you're from and ask your question. Uh, hi, Dr. Pollack. I am from Baldwin Harbor, Long Island, uh, New York. And uh, very good information. Now, the magnetic therapy is uh, in for a while. Now, is this something new? And can the patient with shunt can use the magnetic therapy? So that's a very important question. And thank you. Um, magnetic field therapy is old, but it's relatively new in the U.S. And there are relatively few practitioners who are actively using it in the U.S. And there are relatively few medical providers who are expert at magnetic field therapy. So there are lots of doctors who are doing magnetic field therapy in their offices, but they have had very poor training very often. So they don't really know the full potential value of what they're doing. In the long run though, most people need magnetic field therapy in the home setting. Because if you want to prevent aging, if you want longevity, you can't just treat a problem for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, one treatment and then be done. The body is constantly um, repairing itself, constantly replacing and repairing itself. In order to help that process, not to leave things to chance, then you need to have your own magnetic therapy system in the home setting. And you probably should have the right one. Now, in terms of things that are in the body that are not normally in the body, like metals, if you have a joint replacement, or you have a pacemaker installed, or you have shunts, uh, or you have ports, all of these can. Um, be essentially a used, a magnetic field therapy can be used with many of them or most of them. With pacemakers, you have to be extremely careful and you have to really know and work with your cardiologist to know whether you can expose that pacemaker to a magnetic field. You have to really be careful with pacemakers. With implanted um, hardware, like joint replacements and hip replacements, another metal in the body, plates and screws and so on. That's not really a problem, but what you have to do is you have to find out what level of magnetic field is going to irritate that tissue because any metal in the body is a foreign object, is a foreign body. The body doesn't like it there. It was used on purpose for a particular purpose, but it's outlived its purpose. Usually, typically, people just leave it in the body. So unfortunately, heavy metals in the body cause inflammation, and that inflammation leads to complications. And in the case of joint replacements, they have a lifespan. And why do they have a lifespan? If it was that good in the body, you should be able to keep it in the body for the rest of your life. They typically have to be replaced or revised about 15 to 20 years after a placement because it's causing side effects, it's causing inflammation in the body. So you can use it and it will actually stimulate the body to be able to integrate better with that metal. It causes better osteointegration. So I do recommend anybody with the joint replacement should have a lifetime PMF system available every day. Shunts can be different. Shunts can be metal or plastic. If it's a metal shunt, it depends on where it is. Uh, you, know, you probably with metal shunts, you have to use lower intensity magnetic fields because of the ch charge uh, interaction of the magnetic field with the metal and therefore with the tissues around it. So it can irritate it. And whenever you have surgery of any kind, you're damaging nerves. And when you're damaging nerves you, and creating inflammation, you're creating irritated nerves. So when you pass a magnetic field through the tissues and the nerves are irritated, the magnetic field therapy is activating those nerves. 
which can then feel like the magnetic field is causing a problem. It's not causing a problem. It's making you alert to the fact that the nerves in the tissues are hurting and the magnetic field is waking that up. In order to heal those nerves, you have to keep doing the magnetic field. And over time, you gradually increase the intensity and you should normally be able to tolerate it. So shunts can be a problem, particularly brain shunts or shunts that are next to a large blood vessel, right? Or at the base of the brain, for example. These are shunts that you have to be very careful with. And you need expert guidance and advice to be able to know whether you should or shouldn't use magnetic field therapy and what kind. Thank you very much, doctor. Our next question is coming from Stephen. Stephen, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, I'm Steve from Syosset, New York. And um, last night, uh, Dr. Sunil, um, Dr. Sunil Pai said, or yesterday, there was a new PMF technology called uh, cloud advanced technology, I think he said. Um, should we replace our old PMF devices with this? No. Why? Cloud technology, even though it's fascinating and interesting the way they designed it, is still extremely low intensity. And what I said in my slides is intensity matters. In order to affect inflammation deeper in the body, you have to have higher intensity magnetic field. So it doesn't matter how jivey it is, how interesting and brilliant it is. If it's not high enough intensity, it's not going to do you much good. So you got to get yourself to get the right machine. If you have another machine already, then you have to know how the machine you have compares to that one. And again, what I would recommend is, this is not an endorsement for my book, and you don't have to get my book, but if you want to get educated, I would suggest you get the Supercharge uh, um, Your Health book, Supercharge Charge Your Health with PMF's book, because that talks about the different machines and what they do, and it gives you some, some sense of choices for what you should consider. If you're thinking about replacing your equipment, but I would not replace another PMF device with a cloud, just because it sounds fancy. Well, I, and then I thought that the cloud was a device that actually was, um, um, Dr. Um, Pai was talking about um, all the EMFs in the, uh, you know, that were that were living in the cloud kind of protected you from that as opposed to was the type of machine that you're talking about. Um, no, um, all PMFs help the body to become more resilient, right? We talk about homeostasis. Every mm -hmm. cell is constantly being bombarded by external forces whether it's EMFs in the environment or EMFs in a machine that you're using. If you're increasing the, the vitality of the body and the ability of the body to repair and recover, then it doesn't matter what, in a sense what kind of PMF you're using as long as it's a strong enough PMF. We cannot escape the environment. This is it. If you want to go to the Antarctic, and even the Antarctic these days is poisoned, right? You can't escape it. And so you need something to be able to repair the body. You can't just sort of de deflect it. You can't deflect it. You can cause vibrational interference with some of these other fields, but that's often not strong enough and not reliable enough. And as you move around, you leave your cloud, what happens? You don't have a cloud around you, right? So it's, it's, it sounds nice, but I don't think it actually works that well. And also Dr. Pai was talking about um, a patented frequency. I don't know if you're familiar with, with his work. How is that something that, that has any sort of extra benefit? I know you're talking about, you know, intensity versus frequency, but can that patented frequency range that they, that they have, uh, have beneficial effects over traditional, uh, PEMF systems? Well, I, I've been, uh, I've been working with magnetic fields for 30 years. I was, I was the vice president for the North American Academy for Magnetic Therapy in the early 90s. And we had these arguments all the time. And the answer is intensity matters. Now, at certain levels of function, if you have, let's use a pond, for example, and you have something floating on a pond, or the pond, the water in the pond is moving in a certain direction against a certain object in the pond. And that water you know, has a very low frequency, right? And it's moving toward that object. But if, if the water gets too high, too strong, or too fast, it's going to overwhelm whatever is at the end of that pond. So frequencies are basically like that. The body is full of frequencies. I, don't, I didn't have that slide here today, but the body is radiating a huge number of frequencies. It's a vast range of frequencies. Pick a frequency. What's it gonna do? How many other frequencies does the body need? 
at any given moment, at any given time. We are not so smart that we can say this is the only frequency the body needs or that this is the only frequency the body needs for this problem. Because the problem is very few studies have been done to compare frequencies and to compare the value of a frequency and intensity simultaneously. Right, so there's just not enough research to say that frequency is the best ever. It's conceptual and it may make some sense conceptually and it may be brilliant and it may be very interesting, but what is it really doing in terms of health and healing? Okay. I don't, I still, I, that question, as far as I'm concerned, is still very wide open. And should we be protecting ourselves? You know, going going back to the cloud question, should we, whether it works or not, I'm not talking about the, you know, the veracity of any of the claims that, that were made, but um, should, in the ideal world, should we be concerned and be trying to protect ourselves from all of the, the EMFs that, that we're being bombarded with? You can't. You'd have to shield yourself with an aluminum wrap. And even wherever the wrap is not tightly up against you, the, the electric fields sneak in, All right? So you can't completely, you, you cannot completely protect yourself. And if you can't, <clears throat> this is like the idea of health is the absence of disease. Health is not the absence of disease. It's just the absence of disease. But what's health? You have to do things to maintain health. You have to eat right. You have to have the right amount of rest. You have to have the right attitudes. You have to do all the right things to have good health. So in other words, if you work towards optimization, then that's going to be better than trying to protect yourself against something that is only going to happen now and then, right? Or if it, because it does happen around us, we're totally surrounded by it, especially Western civilization, uh, you can't, you just can't possibly protect yourself enough. And therefore, my emphasis has always been make yourself healthy. Don't, don't spend as much time or energy or money resources on protection. Now, obviously, if, you're, if your house is right next to a microwave tower, the best answer for that is move, right? You can't protect yourself from that. It's just too much and it's all, it's all day long, 24 seven. And what about um, like, with like cell phones, we're walking around with our cell phones. Should we be, should we not have them near us while we're sleeping? Should we not put them near our head? Is that, I mean, that's something that we can do minimally to protect okay, ourselves. Okay, so, so yeah, that's, that's a very, very important question. So we should, as much as we can, minimize our exposure. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, now, so what I, what I would suggest we do is that when you can eliminate, Wi-Fi is clearly a, a, an issue. Um, smartphones are an issue, for example, and I didn't talk about this, but EMFs versus PEMFs, electromagnetic fields in the environment, I call them environmental magnetic fields, which are primarily Wi-Fi, microwaves, and Wi-Fi, but they also include radio signals, they also include television signals, and they also include radar, right? But EMFs in the environment, our exposure to them is incredibly variable. So if you have a cell tower here, right, then how far away do you have to be from your cell tower to have almost no effect from it? I showed you the slide about intensity matters. Well, that same slide relates to uh, the magnetic field uh, that's damaging to us. The farther away you are from it, the less effects there are from it. In fact, there may be more going on in your body without that, just on its own, than would happen from that. So proximity and the time of exposure becomes a critical factor. When you put a cell phone to your ear and you hold it there for half an hour while you're taking a call, you take the cell phone away, you'll notice that it's very red. Basically, your, your ear was being cooked. And why was it being cooked? Because microwaves are absorbed by the body. That's the principle of microwave ovens. You put something in it and you bombard it with these very short frequencies that are absorbed by whatever's in the microwave oven, and then it's cooked. So you're cooking your ear. Keep your phone away from you. Go on speaker as much as possible, right? Do not use the phone against your head as much as possible. Try not to use the phone against your head. So always put it on speaker or use a connector. I don't like the wireless. I don't like Bluetooth wireless. So if you're, a, if you're really crazy about magnetic field exposure avoidance, don't use Bluetooth. That's mm -hmm. still microwaves. It's weak, but it's still microwaves. And I see people walking around all day long with their Bluetooth in their ear. 
So use a, 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 a tube connector, a sound connector, which is terrible. The sound quality is actually horrid. Or again, a speaker. We, a sound connector, are you talking about the, like the wired? Or how about the wired headsets that you plug in with the, the ones that originally came with these smartphones before the Bluetooth became popular? Those are definitely better than Bluetooth. Okay. But you're still having a little bit of electromagnetic field, tiny, not strong enough to be a problem from okay. that little bud in your ear. But the Bluetooth is worse because they have to amplify the signal significantly. So there's a lot more electrical activity going on with a Bluetooth pod than there is with a wired connection. Okay. And I know that signals um, diminish, the power of the signals diminish very quickly. So what would be a safe distance to keep our phone away from us? Well, you know, I, I, I'm sure we're all surrounded by electronics all day. I'd love to, if, I, if it made a difference by moving it one more foot away from me, I would love yeah, to. Yeah, one, one or two feet. So we even say with magnetic field therapy, when you have a high intensity magnetic field device, it will definitely interfere with your phone. I've had that happen. I've actually blown two remote controls, TV remote controls with high intensity PMF. I've had a computer screen freeze. So you got to keep these electronics about a foot to two feet away. I would try two feet. From but, ourselves. Sorry. From our bodies. Okay, yes. So our cells from the magnetic therapy device, but our bodies, uh, except when we're doing treatment, obviously we're doing it on purpose. But right. the electronics in the equipment that produces the magnetic field is strong enough to interfere with the electronics of other devices. Okay, thank you. Now you mentioned uh, a book kind of like, you, you know, you, you mentioned how um, when people ask you for proof or ask one of your colleagues for proof, you throw uh, power tools for health, how pulse magnetic fields help you. What does it show in there that that um, is the is the research that that this is, I guess is all based on? All right, there are five hundred references in the book. I had to pull these references from a lot of various sources because magnetic field and information is not in sort of like one place. Um, so I, I have references. I give references for each of the actions of magnetic fields, and that's critical because the actions are foundational. They're fundamental, and it doesn't matter what the disease is. Most diseases share the similar share similar kinds of actions. And so if you can identify the benefits of magnetic fields relative to those actions, then and they're referenced, that's that's important. And then I review 50 different diseases or health conditions, and I provide references for those. So there's over 500 references in the book over a variety of different issues. Now, are there enough references for any given problem or any given solution or any given action? No, there's always room for more. Uh, science. But the point is that there's a, a lot of science out there. there. You can't make the statement there's no science.